Somebody said, uh-oh, we're in trouble. He's yelling. He hasn't even started preaching yet. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'll just go ahead and preach. Somebody's going, and make announcements. No, I'm going to preach. Come on now. Amen. How many of you know that you've got to learn to walk on water? I've had about 15 different directions I've wanted this sermon to go this week. And the Lord just been put this in my spirit. I received an email, and, and it just got the thought stirred in my heart, and, and it would not let me go. And it has captivated me. And I believe that today, some of you need to know how to walk on the water like never before. Father God, I thank you for this day before we read your word. I pray that you will open your word to us. Help us to change from the inside out. We will not be a church that tries to clean up the outside. Lord, we will be a church that watches you change them from the inside. You are the living God. You are the mighty king. For who is clean unless the Lord cleans them? And who has been changed unless it's an eternal change by the grace of Jesus Christ? Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. amen and amen. Well, Matthew chapter 14, verse number 22. I do feel it's imperative to tell you we're concluding our 28 days to change this week. And if you have not received this week's devotional, which none of you should have in this service yet, you need to get it before you go. Even if you don't want it, I want you to take it home so that in the darkness, when the devil's trying to destroy you, it'll fall out of your Bible and you can read it. Because it's going to point you back to your Bible. Because when you won't go to your Bible, we're sending you something that's going to point you back to your Bible. And that's where you're going to find your power. Amen. And also, we want to give everybody that's here today this gift of your free next uh, uh, three months devotional. Please, take yours. Somebody said, well, I don't want somebody else not to get one. No, you get yours because you need it just as much as anybody. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 I told them the last service, they were kind of quiet on me that I was going to sit a bunch of chairs up here and promote the amen corner. Amen. So, uh, let's get to the Word. Matthew 14, 22 reads like this. Immediately after this, when? Immediately. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake. So why are they crossing the lake? Jesus told them to. So I had to get to the other side. That, that's really good. Amen. <laughs> but why are they trying to get to the other side? Amen. Jesus told them to go to the other side. And Jesus sent them across to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. And it, it shocked me that Jesus could actually get time by himself. And night fell while he was there alone. Some of you need to know you need to get some alone time with God. Amen. Meanwhile, whew, meanwhile, that, that covers a lot, doesn't it? Some of you are in the meanwhile. The disciples were in trouble doing what? What Jesus told them to do. I want you to notice that. They're in trouble doing what Jesus told them to do. They are far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. Sometimes when you're doing what Jesus tells you to do, you're still going to fight life's storms. And instead of wondering where he is, you ought to start trusting in who he is. Verse number 25, about 3 o'clock in the morning. How many of you know it's never when you think it would be convenient, but about 3 o'clock <laughs> in the morning... Jesus came toward them. I just had this pop into my heart. It doesn't matter what time it is when you're in a storm. Amen. Jesus came toward them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. And aren't you glad that sometimes it may freak you out when he begins to move, but then suddenly you know it's him moving. Amen. Amen. Then Peter called to him, or excuse me, he spoke to them at once. He said, don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. 
So Peter went over the side of the boat, and he walked on the water toward Jesus. Amen. Now, most of you have heard this story in one way or another since you were very young, how that Jesus called Peter out, and he walked on the water, and the next thing that happens to Peter is he begins to sink. And we have been, listen to me now, we have been taught to focus on his sinking because we don't believe it's possible to focus on his walking. Because why? We're too busy expecting we're going to fail again. We're too busy setting ourselves up for our next backsliding. I'm going to tell you something. I believe in the power of a living God who is able to keep you and sustain you and to not only take you from where you are, but take you to where you never dreamed possible because my God has a way of making the impossible possible in Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. So if you're waiting on him to sink, it's not the focus of my message. The focus of that sermon would be Peter had to realize that at a new level, listen to this, some of you need to get this, at a new level, when you choose to change, that's what we've been talking about, when you choose to change and you come to a new level, the only way it is possible for you to walk there is to walk with Jesus every step of the way. Amen. It's the only way possible. And there are many messages that are preached on the failure side of this story. And there will be many more preached about that truth. But today, instead of failure, let's focus on faith. Let's focus on this scripture. Watch this now. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water. My goodness. Peter has watched as Jesus has come walking on the water. I know mythology talks about different, you know, gods and things of, that are created. Mythology is just simply myth. History tells us that Jesus came walking on the water. First person, history of the world, to walk on water. We can put a man on the moon, but we can't make a man walk on just standard water. Somebody, I was researching this, people said, I walk on water all the time. I skate on ice. See, some of you, that's what your faith is. You've got to change it to fit yourself so you can do what you think you can do. But I'm looking for somebody who's willing to believe him the way he said it was, trust God the way he said it would work, and then walk out there even though it doesn't make sense and watch God cause you to do the impossible. And Peter said, I want to come to you. And faith caused him to, watch this, to come out of the boat, and he became the second man in the history of the world to walk on water. Wow. We find the relevance in this for us today when we look at this from the perspective of the fact that he actually did the impossible. Remember that. You are going to have to learn to believe God for the impossible if you want the life he's promised you. You see, the phrase walking on water is an example of things that are impossible. I can hear some of you now, you know, my wife sometimes will say, we need to do this, we want to do this, we want to do that, and I'm looking at it, I'm going, what do you want me to do next, walk on water? Some of you are going, Pastor, you would never respond like that. <laughs> yes, I would, and God makes me confess it in front of all of you. <laughs> I can't do it all. You may not say walk on the water, but you'll say things, what do you expect of me? And when you feel like God's done the same, Lord, what do you want me to do? Do the impossible? The simple question today for us is how can the impossible become possible? You see, how can there be hope where there seems to be no hope? How can you break the bond to sin that has held you captive for so long you're going to have to learn to walk on the water? How can you get free from that thing that you've repented of uh, more than you've done. Some of you don't understand what I said, but some of you get it completely. There are times in my life I might have failed once, but I, re I repent over that thing a thousand times. You might have failed a thousand times, but you've repented 10,000 times. How are you going to get free from that thing? Not in your boat. How are you going to see God help you forgive the destruction of your trust that another has caused. 
Somebody says, I just can't. That's because it's impossible to you, but you messed up and you came in here today and I have come to bring you a message of hope that the impossible will cower before a God who is, who is all-powerful. How can there be hope for you to dream again when your innocence has been shattered? How are you going to manage to not be another st statistic in a messed up world? Now watch this. How are you going to manage not being another statistic when you've already joined the numbers of the statistics? The impossible is going to have to become possible. The answer is quite simple. You're going to have to learn to walk on water. That's all you've got to do. <laughs> so I've decided our altar call today will not be here. We're going to all go to Warhill Park. Walk on the water. Me first. That was a very wise comment. You first, Pastor. Amen. Woo! I'll follow you anywhere as long as you're leading the way. Amen. Man, I feel God in that. Amen. Very good. Very good. Now I'm going to throw it back on you. He's already walked there. But how can I do that, you ask? Are you ready for this? This is profound. I mean, it's profound. Listen, this is how you're going to walk on the water. You ready? You got to get out of the boat. Amen. You can't walk on water inside the boat. It's that simple. Peter would have never known the thrill of walking on the water if he had waited for Jesus to get in the boat. You see... If all he was after was a little comfort of knowing that the Savior was there, he would have no story to tell. People had to ask him for the rest of his life, tell us what it was like to be with Jesus. Tell us what it was like to see him heal the lame. Tell us what it was like for, for to, to see the bread break and all these stories. But then they would come down that one story and they would look at him and they're like, you ask him, you ask him. And he's like, Let me, you want to know how it's like to walk on water? You see, half the disciples, no, let me rephrase that, 11 of the disciples just wanted Jesus in the boat so they could know they were going to survive the storm because they already knew he could do it. But Peter said, if that's you, I want to come out of this boat. I'm getting ahead of myself. You see, if you're simply satisfied knowing that you are a Christian family, that we all have the right parts to know that Jesus is in our boat, we will never know what it is like to truly walk out our faith. Here's the truth that you're going to have to come to. Are you ready for this? You need to log this somehow. Get this. The boat is not your friend. They call this a dramatic pause. The boat is not your friend. Some of you are holding on to that boat for dear life. I'll never forget when we changed these chairs out. Uh, uh, a few years ago and the other chairs came out and when I began to look at them I picked them up the the chairs had knuckle marks just just where people were holding on at altar time I'm not going to the altar like that chair can save you for eternity some of you are holding on to your boat going I'm not going to where Jesus is maybe you don't understand yet you see, your boat is a man-made vessel. And that is exactly what our feeble attempts to survive are, a vessel. And a vessel is a hollow receptacle that is used to contain something. I want you to catch this. A boat is a vessel. Someone will say, what vessel are you on? We're on the ship such and such. A boat is a hollow container that is used to cross the water. It is used to contain something, to keep it, to try to get it across through the storm. And when you are trusting in your boat, you are trusting in something that you have constructed yourself. You see, we form our boats out of man's feeble attempts to survive the storms to carry us across the waters. We know the sailing might be tough, but we just want to get to the other side. We don't want change in the storm. We just want to survive the storm. But we must expose our boats for what they really are. 
hollow attempts to contain us and protect us from drowning. And I know how it is. Last service, I had my brother stand up and tell a story. He and his wife and Pastor Ron and Dee were down in, on the Amazon River. And Scott's dream was to fish on that Amazon River and catch a peacock bass. And so they found them one of those tiny little canoes. Now, if you've ever been to the Amazon River, there are things in that river bigger than those tiny little canoes. And they took me up that Amazon River, and I saw those canoes, and I want to tell you, they never allowed me once to step in one of those canoes because those canoes couldn't hold me. So imagine my brother and Pastor Ron in the same little canoe. They are half an inch above the water. As they're rowing back, they get to the place that the piranhas are schooling under them. Now just get this picture. They're half an inch from the water. The ladies begin to call from the boat, turn around for a picture, turn around for a picture. <laughs> brother Ron, little brother Ron begins to shift. My brother, who's my size, is going, brother Ron, brother Ron, brother Ron. The piranhas are all around them. And the ladies are like, smile. And he's like, paddle, paddle, paddle. <laughs> Why? Because he knows that with the wrong shifting, the boat they have placed their trust in to keep them up is going to go under. Somebody needs to listen to what I've come to tell you today. You have built your boat just trying to stay afloat. And you're literally riding out this storm going, paddle, boys, paddle, because we better get across because something's about to take us out. Now let me give you a revelation. That is not what he called you to do. He did not call you to sit there in fear, wondering, oh, if one check goes wrong, we're in trouble. Wondering if I say the wrong word, my marriage is over. Wondering whether or not God loves you. That is your boat, and that is not what God called you to live like. What it is, is a coping mechanism that you have created. Knowing, if I just don't rock the boat, this thing won't end. Knowing, if I just don't rock the boat, everything will be all right. Knowing, some of you are miserable, absolutely miserable. You go, Pastor, you're looking around, no, I'm pretty good today, Pastor. You don't know what the person beside you is going through. Because they're so afraid, they'll set you off. They're so afraid. There are people watching or listening right now. You're so afraid that who you are is going to be exposed in the darkness because your boat is just about to go under. You've placed your faith in your own abilities and you're sitting there screaming, row, boys, row, because we're about to go under. And the problem is you've looked at your boat as your friend because it's the only thing you trust what you have created. But if you want to keep from drowning, you better learn to walk on water. You see, you learn to become a water walker when you can look at the storm swamping your boat and you can let go of the lie that the boat will keep you safe. Some of you don't understand what I'm talking about. Others of you have it. You're, just, you're doing a balancing act in your boat. Just trying. I'll go fishing with some of you guys and... Y'all climb from one end of that boat to the other. That's because you don't move the boat the way that I move the boat. I'm going to tell you, if I came chasing the fish to the other end of the boat, we'd be with the fish. And some of you are holding on for dear life because the winds are blowing. You need to understand this simple truth. Ready for this? Boats are not really that safe. Some of you will cringe when someone you love gets a motorcycle but celebrate when they settle for a boat instead. You know, 1,000 people a year are killed in boating accidents. And those 1,000 people are killed because they thought their boat was safe. Boats are really not that safe. Here's one way that boats are not safe. You ready for this? Your boat can spring a leak when the pressure from outside becomes greater than what structure you have created to resist that pressure. Watch it this way. You're back here, and all you're doing is bailing, trying to keep the boat from going under, and you've got about a quarter of an inch of water, a boat between you and the water. And you're bailing with everything in you. And what are you trying to do? You're trying to save your boat so you can save your life. And your boat is not saving your life. And you're bailing. 
Well, let me rephrase it. People will say to me, well, well, they went through this situation, and it didn't take them out. How come, see, man, God gave me this revelation. This is going to be harsh, but I want you to get this. People will say, how come they got away with it, and I can't? Have you ever been there? Your boat, you're dealing with sin in your life. You know you caused the problem. You know you created the leak. Can I get an amen? amen. And you're going, save me, Jesus. Save me, Jesus. Save me. Jesus has already saved you. That's why you got a leak in the boat. Here's the difference. They're speeding by. They're living in their sin. They're living in their, 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 their promiscuity. They're living in their adultery. They're living in their problem. I'm preaching to somebody. You need to get them. They're living over there, and it looks like they're sailing happy free, and they're zipping by you. But the problem is there's a waterfall called hell that's waiting just around the corner, and Jesus says, your boat is driving you the wrong direction, and he puts a hole in it, and you're calling on him. The reason you're struggling is because he loves you. You won't get that everywhere. He loves you because he didn't die for you to live in the wrong boat. Am I making sense today? Let me hurry. You've got to understand he's trying to rescue you. Another reason boats aren't safe is because they tend to capsize. One of the majority of accidents are the result of that boat flipping over. The reason the boats flip over is because, here's several reasons. I took it off a website, uh, and that made it true, right? This one looked like it was valid. Number one reason for capsizing, or, number, or top, top few reasons for capsizing, the boat's operator could, it turns the boat far too quickly. They see trouble coming, and they're dependent on the boat, and they go, whoa, we can't handle that. That'll take us out. You see, if you're having to run from your faith to sustain your boat... You have a problem. Second reason. They use their sails inappropriately. The question is, what is powering your boat? What's blowing your boat forward? Is it pride? Is it greed? Is it revenge? Is it shame and guilt? What propels you forward? It can cause you to flip over. Here's another reason that boats tend to capsize the wrong anchor usage. Do you remember a few years ago when Mar uh, Marquise Cooper and Corey Smith, the NFL players, their boat flipped over and they drowned? Do you remember that? I don't know if some of you may. The reason their boat flipped over was because they had anchored in an unsafe place and they couldn't get their anchor free. So instead of losing the anchor, he thought he could rev the boat enough to loose the anchor. And it flipped the boat. And this is what the Lord spoke to me when I read that illustration. If you don't watch it, what you thought would sustain you will entangle you. Because you're trying to support a boat that you have no business being in. Eleven said, just get over here and make us feel better about ourselves because you can calm the storms. One said, I don't care about this boat. I need to be where you are. Speed is another common reason for boats to capsize. You're moving too far and not th too fast and not thinking about the consequences. People will say to me, I just can't take it anymore. You'll get blindsided. Somebody will do something on your, wrong, on your job that wrongs you, and you'll walk away from a job you've invested 15 years in because of something that took 15 minutes to wrong you. I've watched people walk away from marriages in a moment, in a moment, that they've built for years. Folks, slow down. And get a hold of God's principles. When that call comes in and your world's falling apart, you need to roll back over and finish your prayer. Preaching truth now. Here's another problem with your boat. You better watch out. It can run aground before you're safe on shore. Because your boat can only carry you so far. And the worst thing about your boat is the storm can flip it over. So why is your faith in a failed boat? Instead, a water walker learns to trust the maker of the water. <laughs> I just had this mental image. 
We're in our boat. The storm's bad. We're out there going, save me. I mean, I've been there. We, some of you may have been with me. We were on the Amazon. I'm trying to hurry. We were on the Amazon River, and we hit something. I don't know what. I, they said it was a log. I was imagining, you know, Crocodilezilla or whatever. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, poof, and they stopped. And as we came to that rushing, <laughs> instantly that boat became more valuable. But you see, I wasn't calling on the boat to sustain me. Because I remember a story that the boat went down, but Paul said, not one hair of your head will be harmed because of who's with you. That's a perfect illustration of knowing the boat really doesn't matter. Let me finish. Hurry. Quickly here, Don. Hurry. Hurry. We must realize our faith in the boat is failed. We must begin to trust the water walker who sees no threat at all in the water. You can then walk on those troubled waters that threaten to swallow you. What did Jesus say? Don't be afraid. Take courage because I am here. When you have become a water walker, your confidence can be sure because he is here. Now, can you imagine what kind of power that is when you lose all the boats that have, you've been trying to keep afloat? But the question is, how can I have that kind of power? And the answer is simple. It's really simple. What, listen to me carefully. It means you're going to have to let go of all the lies that you believe. You see, the boat represents a lie because it's not safe. And what is the greatest lie of all? You ready for this? You need to get this if you get nothing else. You need to get the fact that he can cause you to walk on the water. And you need to realize what lie you've been believing. Listen to this. The lie you've been believing is that you can change your situation anytime you want to. Let me expose that to you a little more. The lie you've been believing is when you say, I could really stop if I wanted to. Let me just tell you what I wrote. The truth is, if you could fix it on your own, then you probably would have already. The truth is, if you could walk away from that habit, it wouldn't control you. The truth is, if you could quit any time, why haven't you? Sorry, I was just waiting on the amens. The truth is, if you are truly master of your own universe, then why are you tossed around by everything that you thought you can control by what you created to contain yourself in? You ever dug a hole thinking you were going where you wanted just to realize you couldn't get out? The truth is, you can't walk on water from inside your own vessel. You can't walk on water if you're determined to keep that hollow vessel afloat. You can't save your life. You can't change your world. You can't save your marriage. You can't save your job. You can't save your family. You can't save your children. You can't do what is necessary to be accomplished as long as you are trying to keep your own boat steady. And Eleven said, Jesus join us and one said I'm ready to join you and he stepped out of the boat and you'll never be free until you learn to walk toward Jesus stand with me if you would today I did I didn't mean to share this illustration with you, but I just feel it imperative today. For some reason, it came to me in the last service. My, my mom made a comment recently that just kind of really shook me. Now, in no way am I a hoarder because if, if I don't feel like we use it enough, I try to give it away. One of my, I joy, my joys is people will come over and help me with a project at the house, and they'll see something 
and they'll ask about it, and, and I, I mean, some of you have been there, and I'll be like, I'll take that. We haven't used it. If you need it, use it. I love to do that. And I'll walk in and ask for my TV. <laughs> but they're helping me in the barn or, or the basement or wherever, something like that, and, you know, uh, and there's a something there, and I don't mind giving that. This is what my mom said. I, I'd gotten something that was kind of sort of an inheritance piece, and, and somebody was asking, do you think Don will value it? And my mom said this. She said, you don't have to worry about it. Don's got his hands on it. It's going nowhere. The reason for that was this. My dad, I mean, I would be a millionaire on eBay today if my dad hadn't thrown everything I treasured away. I'd have all those plastic toys that everybody wants. And my dad, he gets in these moods, and he just starts throwing stuff. Just, just wants the whole basement clean. Not long ago, I knew he had this tool, and I was like, Dad, why are you buying that? I know you have that tool. And he said, I gave it away when I cleaned the basement. I said, yeah, yeah, you did. Amen. <laughs> but I want to talk to you, some of you, the opposite of that. Your basements are full of stuff. Sort of like American Pickers. Anybody ever watch American Pickers? Yeah, I'm a geek. I like American Pickers. Edit that off the TV show, please. <laughs> but as they're digging through that mess that people call their, their backyard, you know, stash or whatever, and they pull out that treasure, and I love what always happens. They go, I didn't know I had that. Because what they wanted was buried under everything they thought they couldn't let go of. Some of you, what you want, you'll never find until you let the boat go down. Until you say, I'm not strong. That's a boat. Pride. We can do this. I don't need anybody's charity. I, I don't need anybody praying for me. I don't need anybody helping. Does anybody understand what I'm trying to preach to you about today? That's your boat. What you're walking in, you're riding in. Your own abilities. My goodness, I'm reminded of the man who stood in the altar in the Bible and threw up his hands and said, I have nothing. I am spent. I am broken. And he was forgiven. Why? Because he didn't support his own boat. He walked toward a God who is greater than the boat. Here's the beauty of the story. The Bible says they're where they're supposed to be, doing what they're supposed to be doing. The storm's going on. They're going under, but Jesus is walking toward them all the time. And Peter said, this isn't safe. You're who's safe. Are you ready to walk towards Jesus today? I want to ask you that today. Are you ready to step out of your man-made boat? The thing that's caused you to worry in the night, can I keep this relationship together? Can I keep this front up? Can I, can I stay in this situation? Can I, can, I, can I do this? Can I do this? Can I do this? Can I, it's all the can I that you can handle till you've about had all you can stand. I mean, no, I'm preaching truth today. And you're ready to expose that as a lie. The truth is, if you feel worthy to stand here today, you're not. We all stand here by the grace of Jesus Christ. We all stand here by the blood of Christ. Because we stepped out of our boat and walked toward him. Where are you today, though? You know you've been sailing in the wrong boat. You're his child, but you've been headed the wrong direction. Where are you today? Where are you? I'm looking for you. God's speaking to you today. Can I see your hand if that's you? Pastor Don, everybody's looking at me. Yeah, yeah, they are. Hand here. Are there others? I'm in the wrong boat. I'm in the wrong boat. I'm in the wrong boat. Come on. Yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I know I've been in the wrong boat, and I'm ready to get out. Somebody says, Pastor Don, what about this kind of boat? No, no, no. The boat is not your friend when Jesus is on the water. There's been numerous hands today. 
some of you, the problem is this. Your boat's tethered to your worst fear. And you can't figure out why you can't get across. It's because you're tethered to yesterday's failure. And you'll, you're trying desperately to cut that loose. But the problem is, you can't cut it loose. You need to get out of the boat. God's speaking to you today. Father, you've seen these hands that have gone up. And Lord, I didn't ask them to bow their heads and do this today because you can't get out of your boat without everybody seeing. There's got to be a literal change of station and position to go over the side of that boat. I'm trusting in Jesus. Now here's what I'm going to tell you as a congregation. I have obeyed the Lord today. I have obeyed the Spirit of the Most High God and brought you a message, and I have fought hell for days. But I have tried to stand here as strong and as confident, not in my ability, but in His ability today, because somebody needs this word, because you're about to go under, but it's time for you to walk toward the one who can deliver you. Let's make it more than metaphorical today in the sense of, of, you know, yes, I'm in this boat and the spiritual. I, I want you physically to make a change of your position right now. Some of you going, he's about to give an altar call. Yes, I am. Where are you? That would step out of that boat this morning. Make your way to this altar toward Jesus. Not toward a man, but toward the Lord. Who would join this brother? I'm stepping out of my boat. Come on. Find yourself a place to pray. Find yourself a place to pray. I, I, I am defeating the enemy by getting out of this boat. This boat cannot sustain me any longer. The boat has not sustained you. Ooh, somebody need to get this. The boat has contained you. But God's come to deliver you. My goodness, I feel the Holy Ghost. Pastors, leaders quickly need to get behind these, but that doesn't mean that there's not room for you down here. Somebody needs to begin to pray for these. Your boat that you thought was sustaining you has contained you in defeat, has contained you in despair. I don't care how long you've been riding in it. It's time for you to realize you can be free by the power of Jesus. You can be free by the power of the Holy Ghost. It's time for you to, my goodness, I feel Jesus, to learn to walk on the water.